Well, some of the difficulties we've had are you know, getting across swollen creeks where there's really no bridge, going through briars and brush. You know, especially this time of the year with all the dense undergrowth, it's hard to get to some of them. A weathered rock along a creek by a cornfield in northern Frederick County. It's easy to miss unless you're a professional surveyor like Eric Gladhill. But this stone is special. It has a name, Stone 77. And like the other 130 markers spaced every mile along the state border, it has a story. It was put here in the 1760s by surveyors Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, the Mason and Dixon line. P for Pennsylvania on one side, M for Maryland on the other. This one's been here for 260 years almost, so it's probably gonna stay here. There's no immediate threat. It hasn't washed out with floods. It hasn't been plowed, you know, because of its location right here at the top of the bank. Stones like this, there's no need to do anything at the present, but there's some that are in danger. Which is why an intrepid band of volunteers, many professional surveyors like Eric, are wandering through woods and across farm fields. Their goal? To locate these limestone markers and protect them from further damage. Over time, these stones disappear. Is there a shopping center built there? Farming equipment hits them, breaks them off. All that's left is just the base. That's what happened to this marker, Stone 40. Now retired, Pat Simon was a surveyor with Baltimore County and an enthusiastic volunteer with the Mason-Dixon Line Preservation Partnership when he found Stone 40 on Todd Shank's family farm in Hartford County. One day, a person shows up at my front door and he's trying to tell me about some Mason-Dixon marker that's on my property and ask if he could look around and do some surveying. And I wasn't too excited about it in the beginning. The sound of a shovel hitting a stone is very unique. So it was quiet that morning, so as soon as that shovel hit the stone, all there was about six or eight of us, and all the heads just pointed to, came, looked at the same spot. They were like waving their hands, saying, hey, hey, hey. And they actually found it. Today, the original stones sit side by side with a replica, offering a glimpse at what these markers looked like when they were first placed more than 250 years ago. From the coastal flats of the Delaware-Maryland border to the densely forested Appalachian Highlands, most of us know it as the historic boundary between North and South, between slavery and free states. But in 1763, when Mason and Dixon crossed the ocean from England with a shipload of 500-pound stone markers, their mission was about property lines specifically resolving a boundary dispute between the Penn family of Pennsylvania and the Calverts of Maryland. It was two British people, and it was so bad they couldn't decide, so the king of England had to decide for them, saying, this is, we're hiring Mason and Dixon, and they're gonna put these monuments out. One stone per mile along the border, with every fifth stone called a crown stone, bearing the crests of the Penn and Calvert families. I want to thank you for taking care of the monument for the last 30 years here. Richard Ort is the director of the Maryland Geological Survey, or MGS, the organization overseeing the efforts to locate and preserve Mason-Dixon markers. Watch your step, it's a little wet right here today. Today, he's paying a visit to stone number 19, buried in an active quarry in Cecil County. So the monument's looking well-preserved, although it's it's been uh, covered in mud and has seen lots of time and you can see the algae growing on it, but it still has the M and P marks on both sides for Pennsylvania and Maryland. But this marker is under eminent threat. The quarry is planning to excavate a four to 500 foot pit where the marker now stands. We're gonna to have to protect this by removing it. So we'll protect it for the years until we can decide what the best thing to do after the quarry is remediated and if we wanna turn into an educational display or whether we come back and still mark the line with it. By state code, MGS is required to conduct a survey of the stones every decade. 
but there hasn't been a full survey in 40 years. Richard hopes to not only find all of the markers, but eventually get them listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So we're about two thirds of the way done the inventory that we just started. Our plan is to get the ones that we can find so we can document them and put them on the National Registry. We do know that there's gonna to have to be a second effort that's gonna be looking for the lost monuments. These days, surveyors rely on technology like GPS and even drones to locate these missing markers. The typical survey crew these days is one person with a GPS. But back in the 18th century, the tools of the trade didn't come with batteries. Every year at the Colonial Market Fair at the Benjamin Banneker Historical Park in Catonsville, contemporary surveyors like Eddie Gaw break out compasses and chains and relive the old ways. The chain is referred to as a Gunter's chain. It is 66 feet long, 100 links. Mason and Dixon might have used something like this to measure distance, but they wouldn't have used the other antique instrument on display. This is a girly compass. A special kind of compass that enables surveyors to distinguish between magnetic north and true north. It was invented about a century too late for Mason and Dixon. For their directions, they looked instead to the stars, according to surveyor Bob Banzoff. There are certain ways to observe the stars with an almanac that you can tell what the true astronomical time is. Then, knowing the true time, they could do their observations, observe the stars, and figure out where they truly were. Mason, the astronomer, relied on a vertical telescope called a zenith sector. They'd be laying in the mud on the cold ground, waiting in anticipation of a passing star, and then calling time when it did pass the crosshairs. It was quite a complicated process, and they were the two guys that did all the math. And you're talking about spherical trigonometry. It was really something with a pencil. Later, they would use these notes to create the now famous map of the line. And in the end, this map and these markers set in literal stone who lived in Maryland and who lived in Pennsylvania. When you go up in the air, you want to make sure that we see everything around us. For Richard Ort and his team of volunteers, the search for the missing markers continues. The challenge is growing as they work their way into the wilder west. As we start crossing over into the Appalachians and further west, it's taking a little more time to get to those. But you can bet they won't give up the hunt. These 21st century surveyors still get a little starry-eyed when they talk about following in the footsteps of Mason and Dixon. It's respecting and remembering history. When Mason Dixon did this, it was uncharted territory. I mean, people have said what they did then was equivalent to the moon landing. 